I am from the Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board. And for anyone who doesn't know, that's basically the North Wales um, Health Board. And I've been asked to come and speak to you today about some of the work that's been going on, on around um, DRTS and some of the work we've done to really look at the, the outcomes and um, how can we quantify, really, how it affects people, what is, uh, what's measurable, measurable about that. I have to be honest, though, um, I feel a little bit of a fraud because when I'm talking about this work, uh, it's not me who's done most of this work. I've got to say, I've got to get against the ward staff who've done the work that I'm talking about. It's people like Rupert who've really been involved in that work. So I don't want to go getting credit that, um, that isn't mine. The DRTS in Betsy, we've been using now since about September 2014. Um, and it's throughout all the older persons wards, the older persons mental health units, but it's all been, so been pushed in the, in the district general hospitals. And it came about a lot of it because of actually our staff saying, have you seen this? We really want to get involved with this. We want that system. We're being told, you know, there's activity workers going into place, but actually we need the tools to actually do things as well. What, what is available? What, what can we change? And just like this morning, we've had lots and lots of great feedback, great qualitative feedback, lots of stories about how that system has really helped people. But we decided, we thought, well, how can we measure that actually through a different process? Now, in Betsy, we, we use a lot of dementia care mapping. Um, we use it every three months on all our older person's mental health wards. So that way we can actually see what is life like. Uh, on our wards. And we've used that to actually look at this DRTS, um, uh, DRTS system. Again, I feel a little bit um, strange coming to Bradford now because I'm going to explain what dementia care mapping is. And uh, Bradford is the home of dementia care mapping and I'm coming from North Wales to tell you all about it. But if I don't explain it to you all, if you don't know what it is, the rest of the slides are going to be quite meaningless. So I'm actually going to go through what that is. So dementia care mapping is basically, it's an observational tool it's not an observational tool that might be used in a nursing home, can be used in a ward, they have it for using it in the community. And it's about seeing what is the level of well-being or the level of ill-being that a person is going through. You know, how does that person feel? How engaged are they? How much are they enjoying themselves and vice versa? Now what you have is you have a group of mappers who will sit and observe people and make certain um, observations. So it would be things like, what is that person doing? How, how engaged, how much are they enjoying it? And what you tend to find is that you could do that for five minutes, but that doesn't tell you a great deal. You need to do it for quite a few hours, and then you start to get a reasonable idea of what life is like for that person. You can then actually start looking and say, well, what is life like on that ward? Now, one of the other things that Dementia Care Mapping does, it starts to look at staff interaction as well. And these terms, positive person, worker, malignant, social psychology, these are things that we really look at in Betsy. They're things that we find really helpful to understand what's going on in our wards because they're really great teaching tools if you can turn to your staff and say, well, actually, we saw this happen on the ward. Positive person work, that's the stuff that happens, you know, it's not the general staff interactions. It's when something happens that actually results in that increase in well-being. It's something happens that is so positive that actually has a real impact on that person. Malignant social psychology, that's kind of the opposite. It's when there's an interaction that has a negative effect on that person, when actually an interaction actually causes some harm. Now, when these terms were first created, malignant social psychology, it wasn't suggested that staff were going into work saying, oh, let's see how much harm we can cause today. You know, it was more about actually people with good intentions sometimes go about things the wrong way. Sometimes maybe don't have the insight of maybe what kind of psychological damage they might be doing. Because we're often so task-focused that the tax, task takes precedence over the psychological well-being. So it can, something, be, something can be quite simple, really. It can be a case of, you know, there might be a gentleman. Wife might say, every time I visit, he must have had a shave. If he's not had a shave, I, 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 I won't be happy. So one day, say, Barry, the staff come up to him and say, come on, Barry, it's time for your shave. And Barry says, oh, I don't want to shave. Oh, Barry, you've got to have a shave. Come on, it's time for your shave. Oh, no, I really don't want to shave at the moment. Look, Barry, your wife comes in. She's going to not be happy with you if you've not had a shave. She's not going to be happy with us because she's told us we've got to have a shave. So all of a sudden, Barry feels that little bit of intimidation. Barry's thinking, oh, hang on, if I don't do as I'm told in this place, things aren't going to go so well for me. 
you know, and obviously somebody will agree. And what we would counter that with, and we say, those six circumstances shouldn't really happen. Because it's not the conversation with Barry you need to have, it's the conversation with the family to say, you know, sometimes Barry might not have a shave. But that's not because we're neglecting Barry, it's because we're actually listening to him and giving him a person-centred code. We're listening to what he has to say. Other times it's because sometimes we're, we get more focused on the illness. So again, rather than seeing a person, we start to say, um, I mean, I've been to general wards where people have said sometimes, you know, the, the, the dementia in that bed. And that's kind of almost like there's not a person in that bed, it's a, a, a dementia. You think, well, the person held there is straight away, that's destroyed, isn't it? That's, a, that, that's gone. And of course, there's things like organisational demands placed on us make a difference, don't they? You know, we're all very busy, meetings, uh, audits, and they're the kind of things that pull us away from sometimes doing that positive person work and create that malignant social psychology. So like I say, we've been doing that every three months, and it's making a real difference to our practice. Since we've been doing that for a couple of years, we're seeing more and more positive person work. We're seeing less malignant social psychology. Um, it really has been a, a, a fantastic tool to use. Like I said, this mood and engagement coding, like I say, it's not really possible to say after five minutes, this is how that person feels. It needs to be for quite a considerable amount of time. And these are the, the codes that we look at. So you can see the plus five. If you're scoring someone a plus five, they're really engaged, very happy. And then you go plus three, it's a little bit less. Plus one, sort of just neutral, you know. I think majority of people, because a lot of time maybe are just sitting around kind of a plus one stage where people are just quite neutral, really. But then we start to go into people actually getting a little bit irritated. And you can head all the way to a minus five where people are very distressed and very anxious. And you can appreciate that when we do mapping and it's on our um, older person's mental health wards, people come in because they're agitated and they become, they come in because they're anxious. So that automatically affects these scores. And we wouldn't expect to see plus fives. If we saw lots of plus fives on those wards, we would say, well, why has this person been admitted? <laughs> you know, it's that we, we expect lower scores, but we still expect them to, to, to go higher. This is how we mark our behaviours. So there's lots of different types of behaviour, and I'm not going to go through every single one of those. It's just a little mark to say what that behaviour might be. So just as a few examples, if you mark an A, it means it's articulation. You've been in, that person has been interacted with. They've had a conversation. Um, they might have just been waved to and they've waved back. But there's just some sort of interaction that's gone on. G, going back, it's a reminiscence activity. Or maybe talking about the past. You can mark that and say, well, that's what that person's doing during that time. All of a sudden, when you're looking at something like the software, you're starting to pick out those things as well because you think, well, actually, is that person engaged in a reminiscence activity? Are they engaged in maybe something using their intellect? This is when someone's just really not interested or sometimes just very cool and withdrawn, not even looking about what's happening around them. You know, as in sometimes people can be engaged because they're watching. They don't have to be interacted with because to say they're engaged. People are just watching what's happening. And we see this in some of the data we've got here. And that last one, the uh, unresponded to, is maybe when someone wants to be interacted with, wants something, but actually isn't getting any response. And that's the kind of thing, if we were seeing that, would be a big alert for us because we don't want to see that on our wards. We don't want that you to happen. So like I say, with the um, older person's wards, we took some scores sort of before we put the digital software in. We spent a day and we had four patients and we thought, we'll map these four patients and see what things are like before we put the software in. Where are these people in terms of their well-being scores? And Everything I show you now is all confidential. I've not, don't report me to the NMC. I promise none of this is fact. These are real people. Um, we've got Andy. And Andy was a gentleman, basically. He'd been on the ward for quite some time. Started, and he'd been quite anxious when he got there, but he was quite, he'd calmed down a lot. He was really just ready for placement, but unfortunately, it was very hard for him to move. And on that day, he was quite engaged, really. Initially engaged with a rummage table, taking things, picking things up but he came quite frustrated with it. He'd had enough of it, not really engaged with it after a while. And then he sat, stirred at the floor, and then he became just walking around the ward, not really interested in things. And when we did his WIB, we, his well-being score overall over that time, he was on a minus one. So we're talking about someone was hitting a level of ill-being. Barry here, Barry was someone with quite a, a real significant expressive word-finding difficulty. 
you know, someone who you found very hard to communicate with. And on that day, he was sat in the day room again. He was sort of showing some passive engagement with some of the things that were happening. But that was it, really. And again, Barry's score, 0.8. Quite flat, really. Not, not a great deal going on. Colin is a gentleman who was quite agitated. This man had came in quite recently, a new admission. Uh, this was a man just getting used to the ward and would spend a lot of time pacing, um, often getting into sort of arguments with other people as well. And basically, Colin was again walking around the ward. There's no engagement with any of the sort of activities that were available on the tables and things. And he seemed bored, and he was on a minus 1.9. It's quite a significant level of anxiety. And finally, we've got Derek. Derek was someone who really wanted to engage. Derek was someone who really did want to actually get involved and do things. And he would instigate some of that. Um, he was interacting with others when approached. But today, he wasn't really doing that. He wasn't instigating any conversation himself, which was unusual for him. So we hit a 1.2 with Derek. We, we, you know, a bit flat, but a little bit, not too bad, but quite flat. And what we found is, because we'd done this before, and like I said, we'd started to introduce activity workers. And when we introduced activity workers, we already started to see there was some improvement. You know, as soon as the activities workers were involved, there were some changes. So in overall, in the group, we started with an overall web of, um, uh, we started with the overall web down here the before the digital reminiscence, but when we introduced an activity worker, we brought it up to 1.3. Uh, All of a sudden, the group web brought, was brought up 1.3. Now, in both our older persons wards and our district general wards, what we've said is basically people with activity workers need their own space as well. You shouldn't have a space, you shouldn't have to do things in the middle of the ward. And what we found is when we introduced that space, it went up again. And all of a sudden, we hit 2.2. It's quite a significant leap for people who are quite agitated. On the day then that we were mapping these four people, we said, well, now let's introduce the system and let's see what happens. I'm not going to say everyone's going to engage with it. You know, the system might be there and we'll be using it, but it doesn't mean everyone will be around that system. So the data when it was introduced, all of a sudden we have Andy. Again, he was initially just sort of passively engaged during the quiz session that was going on. But then all of a sudden he, became very quite, he really became quite engaged with that. Uh, even though he wasn't active, active, actively participating. You know, he was a person watching what was going on and having that station there actually brought the person to it and see what's going on, what's happening. But then the reminiscence activity started and the participation went up. And we started at a minus one with Andy and finished on a 2.6. So we can say there's quite a big difference in terms of where Andy started and where he finished from bringing that software into place. We look at Barry. Barry was engaging with the quiz. He was pointing out the answers on the screen. And he was sharing some humor about some of the answers when they were wrong. He was celebrated when things were, 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 were going right. And again, big increase. Started with a 0.8 that day. All of a sudden, he's on a 3.1, just for that period of when we bring that software in. Bringing things up, it, it makes a major difference. We have Colin. Though he's passively engaged, his levels of enjoyment increased. He wasn't directly engaged, but all of a sudden, his level of engagement is going up. There's some brief periods where he's quite engaged. And this is a man who started at minus 1.9. Now he's on a 2.4. Talk about big changes in people's well-being. Finally, Derek, he engaged fully with the quiz. Like we say, Derek liked to engage with things. He engaged fully. He took a turn, actually, as the quiz master. He was running the show, and he used a lot of humor. And he started quite well on a 1.2, but now he's up to a 3.3. And I'm saying now, 3.3 on our wards is a really high score. You know, as in someone on an older person health, health ward who's coming there because of anxiety, agitation, that is a good score for someone on that kind of ward. So overall, you can see pre, we started with an overall average of minus 0.25. We introduce an activity worker, it goes up to 1.3. We give that activity worker a space, it goes up to 2.2. Give them the DRTS, it went up to 2.8 overall. It's a big increase overall that we can actually see. And it was good to see because, like I say, it's quantifying that then. It's actually saying we, we can actually evidence this. 
Because it's one thing when we go up to people and tell it's really positive for this person, but actually being able to provide some numbers sometimes, for some people that really makes a difference, you know, to actually say we can, we can prove that's what it's worth.